So Long Island, as we know, is blessed with many coastal rivers and streams. Uh, these streams are a direct legacy of Long Island's glacial history. They're mostly shallow, mostly small, but all groundwater fed with this sort of cold, clear water coming up and supporting an, an abundance of freshwater species and uh, as a, an integral part of Long Island's terrestrial landscape. But our focus today is on their connection to the estuary and their role in the broader coastal ecosystem. That role starts with the story of diadromous fish. These are species of fish um, that have a, a very unique life cycle. And the word diadromous is a Greek word that has its root, uh, for, uh, means running or course. And dia is through. So these are fish that run through different habitats from uh, one to another, and they, they split their life cycle between saltwater and freshwater. Most freshwater fish uh, cannot tolerate saltwater and vice versa, so these are a very unique uh, collection of, uh, of fish that can move back and forth effortlessly between the two. There's two main categories of diadromy. The first is catadromy, so catadromous fish. There's that root running again, and these are fish that run down. So fish that spend most of their lives in freshwater and migrate out to the sea to spawn. Uh, we have one catadromous fish in Long Island. Anybody know the catadromous fish? The American eel, uh, an amazing fish. Scientists are still trying to fully understand its life cycle. As they move upriver, they become yellow on the underbody. They, they become what are known as yellow eels. And they spend the next 10 to 30, potentially even 40 years in the river growing and growing and growing. And in many places, they represent more of the biomass uh, than any other single animal species. And there's lots of them out there where the populations are healthy and they're feeding lots of species there, lots of wading birds, uh, cormorants like to throw them up in the air apparently. And if you don't think there's any value to them, this amazing picture of an adult eagle feeding a yellow eel to its young. Uh, at some point, and again, scientists aren't exactly sure what triggers this, but they transform into silver eels. This is their final transformation, and they become, they reach sexual maturity and reverse this course. They go swim downstream, back through the estuaries, and potentially, in some cases, thousands of miles back out to the Sargasso Sea, where they start this cycle over again, they spawn, and then they die. Uh, an amazing story for our only catadromous fish. Uh, the other, other category of diadromy is anadromy. These are anadromous fish. Um, there's that root running again. These are fish that run up. So fish that spend most of their lives at sea, but migrate into fresh water to spawn. Atlantic sturgeon, striped bass, American shad. Uh, but none of these fish on Long Island because our systems are too small. They require big rivers. These are fish that migrate up uh, the Hudson, for example. Our anadromous fish are two species, alewife and blueback herring. And they're both sort of foot-long fish, highly migratory, uh, schooling fish out in the ocean. And the blue lines actually represent the blueback herring. The blueback go further south than alewives. They go stretch all the way down to uh, Florida. And then when the time is right, and I have time in quotes because the fish don't actually care about the time or what day it is, they're really focused on temperature. So it's the temperature of the water flowing out of the rivers. When it gets to be about 48 degrees, maybe 46, maybe 49, that's what triggers their movement upstream. And they get in to shallow water. They're moving upstream. Uh, they're quite capable swimmers. They can't jump up over a grizzly bear like a salmon can, but they can navigate uh, strong currents and some barriers where there's water for them to swim in. They're not jumpers. And again, back to the story, uh, as they move into the rivers now, a whole nother group waiting for them uh, to feed and take advantage of this bounty. River otters trying to make a comeback on Long Island, uh, raccoons, and a host of different birds. Uh, this is a bird named a herring gull, uh, primarily because of its, uh, appreci uh, its uh, taste for herring uh, when these runs are on in, in places in, in New England, you can find herring gulls lining the shores waiting for these fish. Here's two herring gulls fighting over an alewife. And of course, osprey. Osprey in Long Island, the return, everybody always says St. Patrick's Day, mid-March, precisely at the time when the alewife runs are coming. So they're coming 
after long migration, getting ready for their nesting season at precisely the time the rivers are being filled with these fish for them to prey on. This time of year, if you see an, uh, an osprey carrying a fish, chances are it's going to be an alewife. And the fish are moving upstream, trying to find nice uh, ideal habitat. And there is a difference here. Alewife are after this kind of habitat. They're flat water spawners, nice, calm, flat water, whereas blueback want more uh, moving, flowing current. Uh, each female can lay up to a quarter million eggs. And then when the spawn is, these are not nest builders, they're, they're broadcast spawners, so they're spawning in the water column. Uh, after that's done, the, the adults go back to the ocean. They're in the system for a couple of days, um, maybe a week or so, and then back out to the ocean. They leave these eggs behind, and then the fry hatch. And I tell people, if you're not already passionate about these fish, this picture will get you. This is the cutest little fish you'll ever see, right? Uh, that's a young alewife, probably just a few weeks old. But they, they start immediately moving uh, downstream and growing and feeding, and they make their way into the estuary and eventually back out to the ocean. Uh, by the time that happens, they're a, a year old, about three inches long and eventually off and schooling in, in age groups on the ocean and eventually uh, joining the larger groups. And they stay out there for three or four years before reaching, reaching maturity and making their first spawning run back to their natal stream. The third category of diadromous fish is not really a category as much as it's an in-between category. These are not fully resident fish and not fully migratory fish. They're what, we're what are called semi-anadromous fish. And these are fish that, for our purposes, are freshwater fish, essentially, that are able to tolerate salt water, and they can go out into the estuary to forage and, and can survive there. Uh, there's a couple species of, of perch that can do that, but the one we focus on mostly uh, is the brook trout. And the brook trout, when it goes out into the estuary to feed, uh, loses its pigmentation, becomes this beautiful silver color, and they're known as sea run or salter brook trout. And there's an interesting history on Long Island with these fish because uh, when the south shore of Long Island was, it was a popular destination for, for New York sportsmen to come out and hunt and fish, uh, part of that popularity was that the coastal streams were full of huge trout because they were able to go out into the estuary, take advantage of all the food there, and come back in as, as, as big trout. So uh, there's some, some cultural tie to uh, the sea-run brook trout on Long Island. So how are these fish doing? Well, uh, I wouldn't be here talking about it if everything was hunky-dory, obviously. And there's lots of data out there about fish landings and, and uh, population. Um, they've been all under some consideration or listing for protection on different levels. But I'd like to summarize the story in one picture. And if you look carefully, you can see this alewife is clearly sad and frowning. And that's basically the story here, is that they're, they're just not doing well uh, across, their, across their range. Why? Well, it relates to the fact that these are highly migratory fish. They, they're in salt and fresh water, crossing lots of jurisdictions, and difficult to uh, protect in any, in any one way. Um, this chart sort of shows the distinction between the saltwater and freshwater issues. On the saltwater side, uh, these fish are subject to direct catch or bycatch. Uh, eels are harvested as, as those glass eels that come into the estuary. Um, River herring are not targeted so much as they're caught up in bycatch. They're, they're out there on the continental shelf with other target species like Atlantic herring and mackerel, and they get caught up in these huge nets. There's great concern about the impact that these huge fishing uh, systems are having on uh, river herring on, out on the continental shelf. Um, but all these fish are suffering on the freshwater side from water quality. Uh, they're all subject to different degrees to, um, to pollution, probably brook trout the most sensitive to, to needing really good, clean water. And then our focus at SeaTuck is on the habitat side. And this is just getting at this issue of these fish are migratory. They need to be able to move from fresh to salt water. And we've done a very good job of pre uh, preventing that. When we say habitat loss, we're mostly talking about dams, walls of concrete that these fish just cannot navigate. This is uh, a dam in Hards Lake in South Haven County Park. Uh, that that's why this dam was built was a, was a power of mill, like lots of dams were on Long Island. But it not, wasn't just mills. We also impounded uh, tributaries for the commercial cranberry production and for ice harvesting. I tell this story to kids. They want to know why didn't they just 
get their ice from the refrigerator or the, the ice maker. Uh, because this is how we got ice, and, and we collected it and put it in, 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 in barns and hay and, and kept it for the summer. And lots of tributaries in Long Island were impounded for this purpose. And we say a, f uh, a tributary was dammed, and uh, I don't want to give the impression that it was a single dam. In most cases, it's multiple dams. And this is an extreme case, the Browns River in Bayport. Uh, more than a dozen impoundments up and down the river, uh, and everywhere on that right column where it says permanent, these are places where the fish just simply cannot navigate. It's not just dams, it's also culverts. So that situation on the Browns River is a place where you have a per what's called a perched culvert. So these are road and railroad crossings, and the culvert is perched uh, often over low tide, but on high tide, uh, the fish can get up and get through. But this is another big problem. It's not always the dams, it's often the impoundments themselves that are barriers for migratory fish. So why should we care? We have a problem. These fish are not doing well. Uh, why is it important? We go back to all of these species that are feeding on these fish. And their fish, in, in most cases, are, are taking energy of the ocean and transporting it into our upland habitats. And as I mentioned, precisely at a time when a lot of species are getting ready for their own spawning and breeding seasons. And all these pictures are focusing on, on predators eating adult fish. Think about all of those eggs being laid, all of those tiny glass eels swimming into the estuaries, all of those tiny, super cute alewives and river herring drifting out into the ocean, into the estuary. All of those are feeding lots and lots of other smaller predators out there. Um, it's, it's hard to find something that doesn't feed on one of these species. It's, it's really not an, over uh, uh, an exaggeration to say that these fish are really helping to drive our entire coastal ecosystem. Uh, we call them um, keystone species in that regard, species that the entire ecosystem is built upon. So what can we do to try to address this habitat loss? Um, we're trying to reconnect these rivers and get these fish uh, past some of these barriers. Uh, for the past seven or eight years, we've been working to reconnect and restore, and mostly that's been through fish ladders. So this is that same Hards Lake Dam. This is the first permanently installed fish ladder on Long Island. And the, the great story about this, the workers, as they were literally finishing bolting this thing to the dam, or to the, to the dam in early uh, March that year, and they were lifted the boards out, the fish were already there, and immediately, within an hour or so, started coming up the ladder. Um, they, they are trying to go upstream, they can smell that flowing water, and they follow it. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of, if you build it, they will come kind of a story. Uh, this is a rock ramp built on the Peconic River in Riverhead, not a metal box, but a, a, a spillway removed, and then a, a sort of a natural-looking stream built there that the fish can navigate. And Argyle Lake in Babylon, this historic Argyle Lake facade, uh, we were able to convince the village of Babylon to install a fishway. And so this is a scene that we're hoping to bring to Long Island. Um, the perfect fix for, for reconnecting tributaries and advancing migration rates is to remove some of these dams that, as I mentioned, were built to power mills, uh, harvest cranberries, and, and create ice, none of which we need anymore. And there were some impoundments built for recreational purposes and aesthetic purposes and are still serving those, those goals, but a lot of our dams are just uh, persisting f with no actual purpose. This is a, uh, a restored tr uh, stream from Vermont, and when the impoundments are removed, these streams very easily uh, reform their historic channels, and it doesn't take a lot to restore these areas. People, I think, envision too often that they're going to be left with a muddy mess, but these things very quickly regrow and renaturalize and turn into beautiful uh, streamside meadows and eventually forests.